section fifty part two chapter five continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain don marcelo passed the rest of the night tormented with the cold the only thing which worried him just then he had abandoned all hope of life even the images of his family seemed blotted from his memory he worked in the dark in order to make himself more comfortable on the chests burrowing down into the straw for the sake of its heat when the morning breeze began to sift in through the little window he fell slowly into a heavy overpowering sleep like that of criminals condemned to death or duelists before the fatal morning he thought he heard shouts in german the galloping of horses a distant sound of tattoo and whistle such as the battalions of the invaders made with their fifes and drums then he lost all consciousness of his surroundings on opening his eyes again a ray of sunlight slipping through the window was tracing a little golden square on the wall giving a regal splendor to the hanging cobwebs some one was removing the barricade before the door a woman's voice timid and distressed was calling repeatedly master are you here he sprang up quickly wishing to aid the worker outside and pushing vigorously he thought that the invaders must have left in no other way could he imagine the warden's wife daring to try to get him out of his cell yes they have gone she said nobody is left in the castle as soon as he was able to get out don marcelo looked inquiringly at the woman with her bloodshot eyes dishevelled hair and sorrow-drawn face the night had weighed her down pitilessly with the pressure of many years all the energy with which she had been working to free desnoyers disappeared on seeing him again oh master master she moaned convulsively and she flung herself into his arms bursting into tears don marcelo did not need to ask anything further he dreaded to know the truth nevertheless he asked after her husband now that he was awake and free he cherished the fleeting hope that what he had gone through the night before was but another of his nightmares perhaps the poor man was still living they killed him monsieur that man who seemed so good murdered him and i don't know where his body is nobody will tell me she had a suspicion that the corpse was in the fosse the green and tranquil waters had closed mysteriously over this victim of the night desnoyers suspected that another sorrow was troubling the mother still more but he kept modestly silent it was she who finally spoke between outbursts of grief georgette was now in the lodge horror-stricken and shuddering she had fled there when the invaders had left the castle they had kept her in their power until the last minute oh master don't look at her she is trembling and sobbing at the thought that you may speak with her about what she has gone through she is almost out of her mind she longs to die i my little girl and is there no one who will punish these monsters they had come up from the cellars and crossed the bridge the woman looking fixedly into the silent waters the dead body of a swan was floating upon them before their departure while their horses were being saddled two officers had amused themselves by chasing with revolver shots the birds swimming in the moat the aquatic plants were spotted with blood among the leaves were floating some tufts of limp white plumage like a bit of washing escaped from the hands of a laundress don marcelo and the woman exchanged a compassionate glance and then looked pityingly at each other as the sunlight brought out more strongly their aging wan appearance the passing of these people had destroyed everything there was no food left in the castle except some crusts of dry bread forgotten in the kitchen and we have to live monsieur exclaimed the woman with reviving energy as she thought of her daughter's need we have to live 
if only to see how god punishes them the old man shrugged his shoulders in despair god but the woman was right they had to live with the famished audacity of his early youth when he was travelling over boundless tracts of land driving his herds of cattle he now rushed outside the park hunting for some form of sustenance he saw the valley fair and green basking in the sun the groups of trees the plots of yellowish soil with the hard spikes of stubble the hedges in which the birds were singing all the summer splendor of a countryside developed and cultivated during fifteen centuries by dozens and dozens of generations and yet here he was alone at the mercy of chance likely to perish with hunger more alone than when he was crossing the towering heights of the andes those irregular slopes of rocks and snow wrapped in endless silence only broken from time to time by the flapping of the condor's wings nobody his gaze could not distinguish a single movable point everything fixed motionless crystallized as though contracted with fear before the peals of thunder which were still rumbling around the horizon he went on toward the village a mass of black walls with a few houses still intact and a roofless bell tower with its cross twisted by fire nobody in the streets sown with bottles charred chunks of wood and soot-covered rubbish the dead bodies had disappeared but a nauseating smell of decomposing and burned flesh assailed his nostrils he saw a mound of earth where the shooting had taken place and from it were protruding two feet and a hand at his approach several black forms flew up into the air from a trench so shallow that the bodies within were exposed to view a whirring of stiff wings beat the air above him flying off with the croakings of wrath he explored every nook and corner even approaching the place where the troopers had erected their barricade the carts were still by the roadside he then retraced his steps calling out before the least injured houses and putting his head through the doors and windows that were unobstructed or but half consumed was nobody left in villeblanche he descried among the ruins something advancing on all fours a species of reptile that stopped its crawling with movements of hesitation and fear ready to retreat or slip into its hole under the ruins suddenly the creature stopped and stood up it was a man an old man other human larvae were coming forth conjured by his shouts poor beings who hours ago had given up the standing position which would have attracted the bullets of the enemy and had been enviously imitating the lower organisms squirming through the dirt as fast as they could scurry into the bosom of the earth they were mostly women and children all filthy and black with snarled hair the fierceness of animal appetite in their eyes the faintness of the weak animal in their hanging jaws they were all living hidden in the ruins of their homes fear had made them temporarily forget their hunger but finding that the enemy had gone they were suddenly assailed by all necessitous demands intensified by hours of anguish desnoyers felt as though he were surrounded by a tribe of brutalized and famished indians like those he had often seen in his adventurous voyages he had brought with him from paris a quantity of gold pieces and he pulled out a coin which glittered in the sun bread was needed everything eatable was needed he would pay without haggling the flash of gold aroused looks of enthusiasm and greediness but this impression was short-lived all eyes contemplating the yellow discs with indifference don marcelo was himself convinced that the miraculous charm had lost its power they all chanted a chorus of sorrow and horrors with slow and plaintive voice as though they stood weeping before a bier monsieur they have killed my husband 
monsieur my sons two of them are missing monsieur they have taken all the men prisoners they say it is to work the land in germany monsieur bread my little ones are dying of hunger one woman was lamenting something worse than death my girl my poor girl her look of hatred and wild desperation revealed the secret tragedy her outcries and tears recalled that other mother who was sobbing in the same way up at the castle in the depths of some cave was lying the victim half dead with fatigue shaken with a wild delirium in which she still saw the succession of brutal faces inflamed with simian passion the miserable group forming themselves into a circle around him stretched out their hands beseechingly toward the man whom they knew to be so very rich the women showed him the death pallor on the faces of their scarcely breathing babies their eyes glazed with starvation bread bread they implored as though he could work a miracle he gave to one mother the gold piece that he had in his hand and distributed more to the others they took them without looking at them and continued their lament bread bread and he had gone to the village to make the same supplication he fled recognizing the uselessness of his efforts end of section fifty one part two chapter six of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six the banner of the red cross returning in desperation to his estate don marcelo desnoyers saw huge automobiles and men on horseback forming a very long convoy and completely filling the road they were all going in his direction at the entrance to the park a band of germans was putting up the wires for a telephone line they had just been reconnoitering the rooms befouled with the night's saturnalia and were ha ha ing boisterously over captain von hartrott's inscription bitte nicht plündern to them it seemed the acme of wit truly teutonic the convoy now invaded the park with its automobiles and trucks bearing a red cross a war hospital was going to be established in the castle the doctors were dressed in grayish green and armed the same as the officers they also imitated their freezing hauteur and repellent unapproachableness there came out of the drays hundreds of folding cots which were placed in rows in the different rooms the furniture that still remained was thrown out in a heap under the trees squads of soldiers were obeying with mechanical promptitude the brief and imperious orders an odor of an apothecary shop of concentrated drugs now pervaded the quarters mixed with the strong smell of the antiseptics with which they were sprinkling the walls in order to disinfect the filthy remains of the nocturnal orgy then he saw women clad in white buxom girls with blue eyes and flaxen hair they were grave bland austere and implacable in appearance several times they pushed desnoyers out of their way as if they did not see him they looked like nuns but with revolvers under their habits at midday other automobiles began to arrive attracted by the enormous white flag with the red cross which was now waving from the castle tower they came from the division battling beyond the marne their metal fittings were dented by projectiles their windshields broken by star-shaped holes from their interiors appeared men and more men some on foot others on canvas stretchers faces pale and rubicund profiles aquiline and snubby red heads and skulls wrapped in white turbans stiff with blood mouths that laughed with bravado and mouths that groaned with bluish lips jaws supported with mummy-like bandages giants in agony 
whose wounds were not apparent shapeless forms ending in a head that talked and smoked legs with hanging flesh that was dying the first aid wrappings with their red moisture arms that hung as inert as dead boughs torn uniforms in which were conspicuous the tragic vacancies of absent members this avalanche of suffering was quickly distributed throughout the castle in a few hours it was so completely filled that there was not a vacant bed the last arrivals being laid in the shadow of the trees the telephones were ringing incessantly the surgeons in coarse aprons were going from one side to the other working rapidly human life was submitted to savage proceedings with roughness and celerity those who died under it simply left one more cot free for the others that kept on coming desnoyers saw bloody baskets filled with shapeless masses of flesh strips of skin broken bones entire limbs the orderlies were carrying these terrible remnants to the foot of the park in order to bury them in a little plot which had been chichi's favorite reading nook pairs of soldiers were carrying out objects wrapped in sheets which the owner recognized as his these were the dead and the park was soon converted into a cemetery no longer was the little retreat large enough to hold the corpses and the severed remains from the operations new grave trenches were being opened nearby the germans armed with shovels were pressing into service a dozen of the farmer prisoners to aid in unloading the dead now they were bringing them down by the cartload dumping them in like the rubbish from some demolished building don marcelo felt an abnormal delight in contemplating this increasing number of vanquished enemies yet he grieved at the same time that this precipitation of intruders should be deposited for ever on his property at nightfall overwhelmed by so many emotions he again suffered the torments of hunger all day long he had eaten nothing but the crust of bread found in the kitchen by the warden's wife the rest he had left for her and her daughter a distress as harrowing to him as his hunger was the sight of poor georgette's shocked despondency she was always trying to escape from his presence in an agony of shame don't let the master see me she would cry hiding her face since his presence seemed to recall more vividly the memory of her assaults desnoyers tried while in the lodge to avoid going near her desperate with the gnawings of his empty stomach he accosted several doctors who were speaking french but all in vain they would not listen to him and when he repeated his petitions they pushed him roughly out of their way he was not going to perish with hunger in the midst of his riches those people were eating the indifferent nurses had established themselves in his kitchen but the time passed on without encountering anybody who would take pity on this old man dragging himself weakly from one place to another in the misery of an old age intensified by despair and suffering in every part of the body the results of the blows of the night before he now knew the gnawings of a hunger far worse than that which he had suffered when journeying over the desert plains a hunger among men in a civilized country wearing a belt filled with gold surrounded with towers and castle halls which were his but in the control of others who would not condescend to listen to him and for this piteous ending of his life he had amassed millions and returned to europe ah the irony of fate he saw a doctor's assistant leaning up against a tree about to devour a slab of bread and sausage his envious eyes scrutinized this fellow tall thick-set his jaws bristling with a great red beard the trembling old man staggered up to him begging for the food by signs and holding out a piece of money the german's eyes glistened at the sight of the gold and a beatific smile stretched his mouth from ear to ear ya yeah, he responded and grabbing the money he handed over the food don marcelo commenced to swallow it with avidity 
never had he so appreciated the sheer ecstasy of eating as at that instant in the midst of his gardens converted into a cemetery before his despoiled castle where hundreds of human beings were groaning in agony a grayish arm passed before his eyes it belonged to the german who had returned with two slices of bread and a bit of meat snatched from the kitchen he repeated his smirking ya yeah, and after his victim had secured it by means of another gold coin he was able to take it to the two women hidden in the cottage during the night a night of painful watching cut with visions of horror it seemed to him that the roar of the artillery was coming nearer it was a scarcely perceptible difference perhaps the effect of the silence of the night which always intensifies sound the ambulances continued coming from the front discharging their cargoes of riddled humanity and going back for more desnoyers surmised that his castle was but one of the many hospitals established in a line of more than eighty miles and that on the other side behind the french were many similar ones in which the same activity was going on the consignments of dying men succeeding each other with terrifying frequency many of the combatants were not even having the satisfaction of being taken from the battlefield but were lying groaning on the ground burying their bleeding members in the dust or mud and weltering in the ooze from their wounds and don marcelo who a few hours before had been considering himself the unhappiest of mortals now experienced a cruel joy in reflecting that so many thousands of vigorous men at the point of death could well envy him for his hale old age and for the tranquillity with which he was reposing on that humble bed the next morning the orderly was waiting for him in the same place holding out a napkin filled with eatables good red-bearded man helpful and kind and he offered him the piece of gold nine replied the fellow with a broad malicious grin two gleaming gold pieces appeared between don marcelo's fingers another leering nine and a shake of the head ah oh, the robber how he was taking advantage of his necessity and not until he had produced five gold coins was he able to secure the package he soon began to notice all around him a silent and sly conspiracy to get possession of his money a giant in a sergeant's uniform put a shovel in his hand pushing him roughly forward he soon found himself in a corner of the park that had been transformed into a graveyard near the cart of cadavers there he had to shovel dirt on his own ground in company with the indignant prisoners he averted his eyes so as not to look at the rigid and grotesque bodies piled above him at the edge of the pit ready to be tumbled in the ground was sending forth an insufferable odor for decomposition had already set in in the nearby trenches the persistence with which his overseers accosted him and the crafty smile of the sergeant made him see through the deep-laid scheme the redbeard must be at the bottom of all this putting his hand in his pocket he dropped the shovel with a look of interrogation ya yeah, replied the sergeant after handing over the required sum the tormented old man was permitted to stop grave digging and wander around at his pleasure he knew however what was probably in store for him those men were going to submit him to a merciless exploitation another day passed by like its predecessor in the morning of the following day his perceptions sharpened by apprehension made him conjecture that something extraordinary had occurred the automobiles were arriving and departing with greater rapidity and there was greater disorder and confusion among the executive force the telephone was ringing with mad precipitation and the wounded arrivals seemed more depressed the day before they had been singing when taken from the vehicles hiding their woe with laughter and bravado all talking of the near victory and regretting that they would not be able to witness the triumphal entry into paris now they were all very silent with furrowed brows thinking no longer about what was going on behind them wondering only about their own fate 
outside the park was the buzz of the approaching throng which was blackening the roads the invasion was beginning again but with a refluent movement for hours at a time great strings of gray trucks went puffing by then regiments of infantry squadrons rolling stock they were marching very slowly with a deliberation that puzzled desnoyers who could not make out whether this recessional meant flight or change of position the only thing that gave him any satisfaction was the stupefied and downcast appearance of the soldiers the gloomy sulks of the officers nobody was shouting they all appeared to have forgotten their nach paris the greenish-gray monster still had its armed head stretched across the other side of the marne but its tail was beginning to uncoil with uneasy wrigglings after night had settled down the troops were still continuing to fall back the cannonading was certainly coming nearer some of the thunderous claps sounded so close that they made the glass tremble in the windows a fugitive farmer trying to find refuge in the park gave don marcelo some news the germans were in full retreat they had installed some of their batteries on the banks of the marne in order to attempt a new resistance and the new arrival remained without attracting the attention of the invaders who a few days before would have shot him on the slightest suspicion the mechanical workings of discipline were evidently out of gear doctors and nurses were running from place to place shouting orders and breaking out into a volley of curses every time a fresh ambulance load arrived the drivers were commanded to take their patients on ahead to another hospital near the rear guard orders had been received to evacuate the castle that very night in spite of this prohibition one of the ambulances unloaded its relay of wounded men so deplorable was their state that the doctors accepted them judging it useless for them to continue their journey they remained in the garden lying on the same stretchers that they had occupied within the vehicle by the light of the lanterns desnoyers recognized one of the dying it was the secretary to his excellency the socialist professor who had shut him in the cellar vaults at the sight of the owner of the castle he smiled as though he had met a comrade his was the only familiar face among all those people who were speaking his language he was ghastly in hue with sunken features and an impalpable gaze spreading over his eyes he had no visible wounds but from under the cloak spread over his abdomen his torn intestines exhaled a fatal warning the presence of don marcelo made him guess where they had brought him and little by little he coordinated his recollections as though the old gentleman might be interested in the whereabouts of his comrades he told him all he knew in a weak and strained voice bad luck for their brigade they had reached the front at a critical moment for the reserve troops commandant blumhardt had died at the very first a shell of seventy-five taking off his head dead too were all the officers who had lodged in the castle his excellency had had his jawbone torn off by a fragment of shell he had seen him on the ground howling with pain drawing a portrait from his breast and trying to kiss it with his broken mouth he had himself been hit in the stomach by the same shell he had lain forty-two hours on the field before he was picked up by the ambulance corps and with the mania of the university man whose hobby is to see everything reasoned out and logically explained he added in that supreme moment with the tenacity of those who die talking sad war sir many premises are lacking in order to decide who is the culpable party when the war is ended they will have to will have to and he closed his eyes overcome by the effort desnoyers left the dead man thinking to himself poor fellow he was placing the hour of justice at the termination of the war and meanwhile hundreds like him were dying disappearing with all their scruples of ponderous and disciplined reasoning End of section fifty one to chapter six continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse 
by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain that night there was no sleep on the place the walls of the lodge were creaking the glass crashing and breaking the two women in the adjoining room crying out nervously the noise of the german fire was beginning to mingle with that of other explosives close at hand he surmised that this was the smashing of the french projectiles which were coming in search of the enemy's artillery above the marne for a few minutes his hopes revived as the possibility of victory flashed into his mind but he was so depressed by his forlorn situation that such a hope evaporated as quickly as it had come his own troops were advancing but this advance did not perhaps represent more than a local gain the line of battle was so extensive it was going to be as in eighteen seventy the french would achieve partial victories modified at the last moment by the strategy of the enemies until they were turned into complete defeat after midnight the cannonading ceased but silence was by no means re-established automobiles were rolling around the lodge midst hoarse shouts of command it must be the hospital convoy that was evacuating the castle then near daybreak the thudding of horses hoofs and the wheels of chugging machines thundered through the gates making the ground tremble half an hour afterwards sounded the tramp of multitudes moving at a quick pace dying away in the depths of the park at dawn the old gentleman leaped from his bed and the first thing he spied from the cottage window was the flag of the red cross still floating from the top of the castle there were no more cots under the trees on the bridge he met one of the doctors and several assistants the hospital force had gone with all its transportable patients there only remained in the castle under the care of a company those most gravely wounded the valkyries of the health department had also disappeared the red-bearded shylock was among those left behind and on seeing don marcelo afar off he smiled and immediately vanished a few minutes after he returned with full hands never before had he been so generous foreseeing pressing necessity the hungry man put his hands in his pockets as usual but was astonished to learn from the orderly's emphatic gestures that he did not wish any money nine nine what generosity was this the german persisted in his negatives his enormous mouth expanded in an ingratiating grin as he laid his heavy paws on marcelo's shoulders he appeared like a good dog a meek dog fawning and licking the hands of the passer-by coaxing to be taken along with him franzosen franzosen he did not know how to say any more but the frenchman read in his words the desire to make him understand that he had always been in great sympathy with the french something very important was evidently transpiring the ill-humoured air of those left behind in the castle and the sudden servility of this ploughman in uniform made it very apparent some distance beyond the castle he saw soldiers many soldiers a battalion of infantry had spread itself along the walls with trucks draught horses and swift mounts with their pikes the soldiers were making small openings in the mud walls shaping them into a border of little pinnacles others were kneeling or sitting near the apertures taking off their knapsacks in order that they might be less hampered afar off the cannon were booming and in the intervals between their detonations could be heard the bursting of shrapnel the bubbling of frying oil the grinding of a coffee-mill and the incessant crackling of rifle fire fleecy clouds were floating over the fields giving to near objects the indefinite lines of unreality the sun was a faint spot seen between curtains of mist the trees were weeping fog moisture from all the cracks in their bark a thunderclap rent the air so forcibly that it seemed very near the castle desnoyers trembled believing that he had received a blow in the chest the other men remained impassive with their customary indifference 
a cannon had just been discharged but a few feet away from him and not till then did he realize that two batteries had been installed in the park the pieces of artillery were hidden under mounds of branches the gunners having felled trees in order to mask their monsters more perfectly he saw them arranging the last with shovels they were forming a border of earth a foot in width around each piece this border guarded the feet of the operators whose bodies were protected by steel shields on both sides of them then they raised a breastwork of trunks and boughs leaving only the mouth of the cylindrical mortar visible by degrees don marcelo became accustomed to the firing which seemed to be creating a vacuum within his cranium he ground his teeth and clenched his fist at every detonation but stood stock still with no desire to leave dominated by the violence of the explosions admiring the serenity of these men who were giving orders erect and coolly or moving like humble menials around their roaring metal beasts all his ideas seemed to have been snatched away by that first discharge of cannon his brain was living in the present moment only he turned his eyes insistently toward the white and red banner which was waving from the mansion that is treachery he thought a breach of faith far away on the other side of the marne the french artillery were belching forth their deadly fire he could imagine their handiwork from the little yellowish clouds that were floating in the air and the columns of smoke which were spouting forth at various points of the landscape where the german troops were hidden forming a line which appeared to lose itself in infinity an atmosphere of protection and respect seemed to be enveloping the castle the morning mists had dissolved the sun was finally showing its bright and limpid light lengthening the shadows of men and trees to fantastic dimensions hills and woods came forth from the haze fresh and dripping after their morning bath the entire valley was now completely exposed and desnoyers was surprised to see the river from the spot to which he had been rooted the cannon having opened great windows in the woods that it hid it from view what most astonished him in looking over this landscape smiling and lovely in the morning light was that nobody was to be seen absolutely nobody mountain tops and forests were bellowing without any one's being in evidence there must be more than a hundred thousand men in the space swept by his piercing gaze and yet not a human being was visible the deadly boom of arms was causing the air to vibrate without leaving any optical trace there was no other smoke but that of the explosions the black spirals that were flinging their great shells to burst on the ground these were rising on all sides encircling the castle like a ring of giant tops but not one of that orderly circle ventured to touch the edifice don marcelo again stared at the red cross flag it is treachery he kept repeating yet at the same time he was selfishly rejoicing in the base expedient since it served to defend his property the battalion was at last completely installed in the entire length of the wall opposite the river the soldiers kneeling were supporting their guns on the newly made turrets and grooves and seemed satisfied with this rest after a night of battling retreat they all appeared sleeping with their eyes open little by little they were letting themselves drop back on their heels or seeking the support of their knapsacks snores were heard in the brief spaces between the artillery fire the officials standing behind them were examining the country with their field glasses or talking in knots some appeared disheartened others furious at the backward flight that had been going on since the day before the majority appeared calm with the passivity of obedience the battle front was immense who could foresee the outcome there they were in full retreat but in other places perhaps their comrades might be advancing with decided gains until the very last moment no soldier knows certainly the fate of the struggle what was most grieving this detachment was the fact that it was all the time getting further away from paris 
don marcelo's eye was caught by a sparkling circle of glass a monocle fixed upon him with aggressive insistence a lank lieutenant with the corseted waist of the officers that he had seen in berlin a genuine junker was a few feet away sword in hand behind his men like a wrathful and glowering shepherd what are you doing here he said gruffly desnoyers explained that he was the owner of the castle french continued the lieutenant yes french the official scowled in hostile meditation feeling the necessity of saying something against the enemy the shouts and antics of his companions at arms put a summary end to his reflections they were all staring upward and the old man followed their gaze for an hour past there had been streaking through the air frightful roarings enveloped in yellowish vapors strips of cloud which seemed to contain wheels revolving with frenzied rotation they were the projectiles of the heavy german artillery which fired from various distances through their great shells over the castle certainly that could not be what was interesting the officials he half shut his eyes in order to see better and finally near the edge of a cloud he distinguished a species of mosquito flashing in the sunlight between brief intervals of silence could be heard the distant faint buzz announcing its presence the officers nodded their heads franzosen desnoyers thought so too he could not believe that the enemy's two black crosses were between those wings instead he saw with his mind's eye two tricolored rings like the circular spots which color the fluttering wings of butterflies this explained the agitation of the germans the french airbird remained motionless for a few seconds over the castle regardless of the white bubbles exploding underneath and around it in vain the cannon nearest hurled their deadly fire it wheeled rapidly and returned to the place from which it came it must have taken in the whole situation thought the old frenchman it has found them out it knows what is going on here he guessed rightly that this information would swiftly change the course of events everything which had been happening in the early morning hours was going to sink into insignificance compared with what was coming now he shuddered with fear the irresistible fear of the unknown and yet at the same time he was filled with curiosity impatience and nervous dread before a danger that threatened and would not stay its relentless course outside the park but a short distance from the mud wall sounded a strident explosion like a stupendous blow from a gigantic axe an axe as big as his castle there began flying through the air entire tree-tops trunks split in two great chunks of earth with the vegetation still clinging a rain of dirt that obscured the heavens some stones fell down from the wall the germans crouched but with no visible emotion they knew what it meant they had been expecting it as something inevitable after seeing the french aeroplane the red cross flag could no longer deceive the enemy's artillery don marcelo had not time to recover from his surprise before there came a second explosion nearer the mud wall a third inside the park it seemed to him that he had been suddenly flung into another world from which he was seeing men and things across a fantastic atmosphere which roared and rocked and destroyed with the violence of its reverberations he was stunned at the awfulness of it all and yet he was not afraid until then he had imagined fear in a very different form he felt an agonizing vacuum in his stomach he staggered violently all the time as though some force were pushing him about giving him first a blow on the chest and then another on the back to straighten him up a strong smell of acids penetrated the atmosphere making respiration very difficult and filling his eyes with smarting tears on the other hand the uproar no longer disturbed him it did not exist for him he supposed it was still going on from the trembling air the shaking of things around him in the whirlwind which was bending men double but was not reacting within his body he had lost the faculty of hearing 
all the strength of his senses had concentrated themselves in looking his eyes appeared to have acquired multiple facets like those of certain insects he saw what was happening before beside behind him simultaneously witnessing extraordinary things as though all the laws of life had been capriciously overthrown an official a few feet away suddenly took an inexplicable flight he began to rise without losing his military rigidity still helmeted with furrowed brow moustache blonde and short mustard-colored chest and gloved hands still holding field-glasses and map but there his individuality stopped the lower extremities in their grayish leggings remained on the ground inanimate as reddening empty moulds the trunk in its violent ascent spread its contents abroad like a bursting rocket further on some gunners standing upright were suddenly stretched full length converted into a motionless row bathed in blood end of section fifty two part two chapter six continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain the line of infantry was lying close to the ground the men had huddled themselves together near the loopholes through which they aimed their guns trying to make themselves less visible many had placed their knapsacks over their heads or at their backs to defend themselves from the flying bits of shell if they moved at all it was only to worm their way further into the earth trying to hollow it out with their stomachs many of them had changed position with mysterious rapidity now lying stretched on their backs as though asleep one had his uniform torn open across the abdomen showing between the rents of the cloth slabs of flesh blue and red that protruded and swelled up with a bubbling expansion another had his legs shot away and was looking around with surprised eyes and a black mouth rounded into an effort to howl but from which no sound ever came desnoyers had lost all notion of time he could not tell whether he had been rooted to that spot for many hours or for a single moment the only thing that caused him anxiety was the persistent trembling of his legs which were refusing to sustain him something fell behind him it was raining ruin turning his head he saw his castle completely transformed half of the tower had just been carried off the pieces of slate were scattered everywhere in tiny chips the walls were crumbling loose window frames were balancing on edge like fragments of stage scenery and the old wood of the tower hood was beginning to burn like a torch the spectacle of this instantaneous change in his property impressed him more than the ravages of death making him realize the cyclopean power of the blind avenging forces raging around him the vital force that had been concentrated in his eyes now spread to his feet and he started to run without knowing whither feeling the same necessity to hide himself as had those men enchained by discipline who were trying to flatten themselves into the earth in imitation of the reptile's pliant invisibility his instinct was pushing him toward the lodge but half way up the avenue he was stopped by another lot of astounding transformations an unseen hand had just snatched away half of the cottage roof the entire side wall doubled over forming a cascade of bricks and dust the interior rooms were now exposed to view like a theatrical setting the kitchen where he had eaten the upper floor with the room in which he descried his still unmade bed the poor women he turned around running now toward the castle trying to make the sub-cellar in which he had been fastened for the night and when he finally found himself under those dusty cobwebs he felt as though he were in the most luxurious salon 
and he devoutly blessed the good workmanship of the castle builders the subterranean silence began gradually to bring back his sense of hearing the cannonading of the germans and the bursting of the french shells sounded from his retreat like a distant tempest there came into his mind the eulogies which he had been accustomed to lavish upon the cannon of seventy five without knowing anything about it except by hearsay now he had witnessed its effects it shoots too well he muttered in a short time it would finish destroying his castle he was finding such perfection excessive but he soon repented of these selfish lamentations an idea tenacious as remorse had fastened itself in his brain it now seemed to him that all he was passing through was an expiation for the great mistake of his youth he had evaded the service of his country and now he was enveloped in all the horrors of war with the humiliation of a passive and defenceless being without any of the soldier's satisfaction of being able to return the blows he was going to die he was sure of that but a shameful death unknown and inglorious the ruins of his mansion were going to become his sepulchre and the certainty of dying there in the darkness like a rat that sees the openings of his hole being closed up made this refuge intolerable above him the tornado was still raging a peal like thunder boomed above his head and then came the crash of a landslide another projectile must have fallen upon the building he heard shrieks of agony yells and precipitous steps on the floor above him perhaps the shell in its blind fury had blown to pieces many of the dying in the salons fearing to remain buried in his retreat he bounded up the cellar stairs two steps at a time as he scudded across the first floor he saw the sky through the shattered roofs along the edges were hanging sections of wood fragments of swinging tile and furniture stopped halfway in its flight across the hall he had to clamber over much rubbish he stumbled over broken and twisted iron parts of beds rained from the upper rooms into the mountain of debris in which he saw convulsed limbs and heard anguished voices that he could not understand he leaped as he ran feeling the same longing for light and free air as those who rush from the hold to the deck of a shipwreck while sheltered in the darkness more time had elapsed than he had supposed the sun was now very high he saw in the garden more corpses in tragic and grotesque postures the wounded were doubled over with pain or lying on the ground or propping themselves against the trees in painful silence some had opened their knapsacks and drawn out their sanitary kits and were trying to care for their cuts the infantry was now firing incessantly the number of riflemen had increased new bands of soldiers were entering the park some with a sergeant at their head others followed by an officer carrying a revolver at his breast as though guiding his men with it this must be the infantry expelled from their position near the river which had come to reinforce the second line of defence the mitrailleuses were adding their tac tac to the cracks of the fusiliers the hum of the invisible swarms was buzzing incessantly thousands of sticky horseflies were droning around desnoyers without his even seeing them the bark of the trees was being stripped by unseen hands the leaves were falling in torrents the boughs were shaken by opposing forces the stones on the ground were being crushed by a mysterious foot all inanimate objects seemed to have acquired a fantastic life the zinc spoons of the soldiers the metallic parts of their outfit the pails of the artillery were all clanking as though in an imperceptible hailstorm he saw a cannon lying on its side with the wheels broken and turned over among many men who appeared asleep he saw soldiers who stretched themselves out without a contraction without a sound as though overcome by sudden drowsiness others were howling and dragging themselves forward in a sitting position the old man felt an extreme sensation of heat the pungent perfume of explosive drugs 
brought the tears to his eyes and clawed at his throat at the same time he was chilly and felt his forehead freezing in a glacial sweat he had to leave the bridge several soldiers were passing bearing the wounded to the edifice in spite of the fact that it was falling in ruins suddenly he was sprinkled from head to foot as if the earth had opened to make way for a water spout a shell had fallen into the moat throwing up an enormous column of water making the carp sleeping in the mud fly into fragments breaking a part of the edges and grinding to powder the white balustrades with their great urns of flowers he started to run on with his blindness of terror when he suddenly saw before him the same little round crystal examining him coolly it was the junker the officer of the monocle with the end of his revolver the german pointed to two pails a short distance away ordering desnoyers to fill them from the lagoon and give the water to the men overcome by the sun although the imperious tone admitted of no reply don marcelo tried nevertheless to resist he received a blow from the revolver on his chest at the same time that the lieutenant slapped him in the face the old man doubled over longing to weep longing to perish but no tears came nor did life escape from his body under this affront as he wished with the two buckets in his hands he found himself dipping up water from the canal carrying it the length of the file giving it to men who each in his turn dropped his gun to gulp the liquid with the avidity of panting beasts he was no longer afraid of the shrill shrieks of invisible bodies his one great longing was to die he was strongly convinced that he was going to die his sufferings were too great there was no longer any place in the world for him he had to pass by breaches opened in the wall by the bursting shells there was no natural object to arrest the eye looking through these gaps hedges and groves had been swept away or blotted out by the fire of the artillery he descried at the foot of the highway near his castle several of the attacking columns which had crossed the marne the advancing forces were coming doggedly on apparently unmoved by the steady deadly fire of the germans soon they were rushing forward with leaps and bounds by companies shielding themselves behind bits of upland in bends of the road in order to send forth their blasts of death the old man was now fired with a desperate resolution since he had to die let a french ball kill him and he advanced very erect with his two pails among those men shooting lying down then with a sudden fear he stood still hanging his head a second thought had told him that the bullet which he might receive would be one danger less for the enemy it would be better for them to kill the germans and he began to cherish the hope that he might get possession of some weapon from those dying around him and fall upon that junker who had struck him he was filling his pails for the third time and murderously contemplating the lieutenant's back when something occurred so absurd and unnatural that it reminded him of the fantastic flash of the cinematograph the officer's head suddenly disappeared two jets of blood spurted from his severed neck and his body collapsed like an empty sack at the same time a cyclone was sweeping the length of the wall tearing up groves overturning cannon and carrying away people in a whirlwind as though they were dry leaves he inferred that death was now blowing from another direction until then it had come from the front of the riverside battling with the enemy's line ensconced behind the walls now with the swiftness of an atmospheric change it was blustering from the depths of the park a skilful manoeuvre of the aggressors the use of a distant road a chance bend in the german line had enabled the french to collect their cannon in a new position attacking the occupants of the castle with a flank movement it was a lucky thing for don marcelo that he had lingered a few moments on the bank of the fosse sheltered by the bulk of the edifice the fire of the hidden battery passed the length of the avenue carrying off the living destroying for a second time the dead killing horses breaking the wheels of vehicles and making the gun carriages fly through the air 
with the flames of a volcano in whose red and bluish depths black bodies were leaping he saw hundreds of fallen men he saw disemboweled horses trampling on their entrails the death harvest was not being reaped in sheaves the entire field was being mowed down with a single flash of the sickle and as though the batteries opposite divined the catastrophe they redoubled their fire sending down a torrent of shells they fell on all sides beyond the castle at the end of the park craters were opening in the woods vomiting forth the entire trunks of trees the projectiles were hurling from their pits the bodies interred the night before those still alive were firing through the gaps in the walls then they sprang up with the greatest haste some grasped their bayonets pale with clamped lips and a mad glare in their eyes others turned their backs running toward the exit from the park regardless of the shouts of their officers and the revolver shots sent after the fugitives all this occurred with dizzying rapidity like a nightmare on the other side of the wall came a murmur swelling in volume like that of the sea desnoyers heard shouts and it seemed to him that some hoarse discordant voices were singing the marseillaise the machine-guns were working with the swift steadiness of sewing machines the attack was going to be opposed with furious resistance the germans crazed with fury shot and shot in one of the breaches appeared a red kepis followed by legs of the same color trying to clamber over the ruins but this vision was instantly blotted out by the sprinkling from the machine-guns making the invaders fall in great heaps on the other side of the wall don marcelo never knew exactly how the change took place suddenly he saw the red trousers within the park with irresistible bounds they were springing over the wall slipping through the yawning gaps and darting out from the depths of the woods by invisible paths they were little soldiers husky panting perspiring with torn cloaks and mingled with them in the disorder of the charge african marksmen with devilish eyes and foaming mouths zouaves in wide breeches and chasseurs in blue uniforms end of section fifty three Two chapter six continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain the german officers wanted to die with upraised swords after having exhausted the shots in their revolvers they advanced upon their assailants followed by the soldiers who still obeyed them there was a scuffle a wild melee to the trembling spectator it seemed as though the world had fallen into profound silence the yells of the combatants the thud of colliding bodies the clang of arms seemed as nothing after the cannon had quieted down he saw men pierced through the middle by gun points whose reddened ends came out through their kidneys muskets raining hammer-like blows adversaries that grappled in hand-to-hand -hand tussles rolling over and over on the ground trying to gain the advantage by kicks and bites the mustard-colored fronts had entirely disappeared and he now saw only backs of that color fleeing toward the exit filtering among the trees falling midway in their flight when hit by the pursuing balls many of the invaders were unable to chase the fugitives because they were occupied in repelling with rude thrusts of their bayonets the bodies falling upon them in agonizing convulsions don marcelo suddenly found himself in the very thick of these mortal combats jumping up and down like a child waving his hands and shouting with all his might when he came to himself again he was hugging the grimy head of a young french officer who was looking at him in astonishment he probably thought him crazy on receiving his kisses on hearing his incoherent torrent of words emotionally exhausted the worn old man continued to weep after the officer had freed himself with a jerk 
he needed to give vent to his feelings after so many days of anguished self-control vive la france his beloved french were already within the park gates they were running bayonets in hand in pursuit of the last remnants of the german battalion trying to escape toward the village a group of horsemen passed along the road they were dragoons coming to complete the rout but their horses were fagged out nothing but the fever of victory transmitted from man to beast had sustained their painful pace one of the equestrians came to a stop near the entrance of the park the famished horse eagerly devouring the herbage while his rider settled down in the saddle as though asleep desnoyers touched him on the hip in order to awaken him but he immediately rolled off on the opposite side he was dead with his entrails protruding from his body but swept on with the others he had been brought thus far on his steady steed enormous tops of iron and smoke now began falling in the neighborhood the german artillery was opening a retaliatory fire against its lost positions the advance continued their pass toward the north battalion squadrons and batteries worn weary and grimy covered with dust and mud but kindled with an ardor that galvanized their flagging energy the french cannon began thundering on the village side bands of soldiers were exploring the castle and the nearest woods from the ruined rooms from the depths of the cellars from the clumps of shrubbery in the park from the stables and burned garage came surging forth men dressed in greenish gray and pointed helmets they all threw up their arms extending their open hands camarades camarades non caput with the restlessness of remorse they were in dread of immediate execution they had suddenly lost all their haughtiness on finding that they no longer had any official powers and were free from discipline some of those who knew a little french spoke of their wives and children in order to soften the enemies that were threatening them with their bayonets a brawny teuton came up to desnoyers and clapped him on the back it was redbeard he pressed his heart and then pointed to the owner of the castle franzosen great friend of the franzosen and he grinned ingratiatingly at his protector don marcelo remained at the castle until the following morning and was astounded to see georgette and her mother emerge unexpectedly from the depths of the ruined lodge they were weeping at the sight of the french uniforms it could not go on sobbed the widow god does not die after a bad night among the ruins the owner decided to leave villeblanche what was there for him to do now in the destroyed castle the presence of so many dead was racking his nerves there were hundreds there were thousands the soldiers and the farmers were interring great heaps of them wherever he went digging burial trenches close to the castle in all the avenues of the park in the garden paths around the outbuildings even the depths of the circular lagoon were filled with corpses how could he ever live again in that tragic community composed mostly of his enemies farewell forever castle of vie blanche he turned his steps toward paris planning to get there the best way he could he came upon corpses everywhere but they were not all the gray green uniform many of his countrymen had fallen in the gallant offensive many would still fall in the last throes of the battle that was going on behind them agitating the horizon with its incessant uproar everywhere red pantaloons were sticking up out of the stubble hobnailed boots glistening in upright position near the roadside livid heads amputated bodies stray limbs and scattered through this funereal medley red kepis and oriental caps helmets with tufts of horsehair twisted swords broken bayonets guns and great mounds of cannon cartridges dead horses were strewing the plain with their swollen carcasses artillery wagons 
with their charred wood and bent iron frames revealed the tragic moment of the explosion rectangles of overturned earth marked the situation of the enemy's batteries before their retreat amidst the broken cannons and trucks were cones of carbonized material the remains of men and horses burned by the germans on the night before their withdrawal in spite of these barbarian holocausts corpses were everywhere in infinite numbers there seemed to be no end to their number it seemed as though the earth had expelled all the bodies that it had received since the beginning of the world the sun was impassively flooding the fields of death with its waves of light in its yellowish glow the pieces of the bayonets the metal plates the fittings of the guns were sparkling like bits of crystal the damp night the rain the rust of time had not yet modified with their corrosive action these relics of combat but decomposition had begun to set in graveyard odors were all along the road increasing in intensity as desnoyers plodded on toward paris every half hour the evidence of corruption became more pronounced many of the dead on this side of the river having lain there for three or four days bands of crows at the sound of his footsteps rose up lazily flapping their wings but returning soon to blacken the earth surfeited but not satisfied having lost all fear of mankind from time to time the sad pedestrian met living bands of men platoons of cavalry gendarmes zouaves and chasseurs encamped around the ruined farmsteads exploring the country in pursuit of german fugitives don marcelo had to explain his business there showing the passport that lacour had given him in order to make his trip on the military train only in this way could he continue his journey these soldiers many of them slightly wounded were still stimulated by victory they were laughing telling stories and narrating the great dangers which they had escaped a few days before always ending with we are going to kick them across the frontier their indignation broke forth afresh as they looked around at the blasted towns farms and single houses all burned like skeletons of prehistoric beasts many steel frames twisted by the flames were scattered over the plains the brick chimneys of the factories were either leveled to the ground or pierced with the round holes made by shells were standing up like giant pastoral flutes forced into the earth near the ruined villages the women were removing the earth and trying to dig burial trenches but their labor was almost useless because it required an immense force to inter so many dead we are all going to die after gaining the victory mused the old man the plague is going to break out among us the water of the river must also be contaminated by this contagion so when his thirst became intolerable he drank in preference from a nearby pond but alas on raising his head he saw some greenish legs on the surface of the shallow water the boots sunk in the muddy banks the head of the german was in the depths of the pool he had been trudging on for several hours when he stopped before a ruined house which he believed that he recognized yes it was the tavern where he had lunched a few days ago on his way to the castle he forced his way in among the blackened walls where a persistent swarm of flies came buzzing around him the smell of decomposing flesh attracted his attention a leg which looked like a piece of charred cardboard was wedged in the ruins looking at it bitterly he seemed to hear again the old woman with her grandchildren clinging to her skirts monsieur why are the people fleeing war only concerns the soldiers we country folk have done no wrong to anybody and we ought not to be afraid half an hour later on descending a hilly path the traveller had the most unexpected of encounters he saw there a taxicab an automobile from paris 
the chauffeur was walking tranquilly around the vehicle as if it were at the cab stand and he promptly entered into conversation with this gentleman who appeared to him as downcast and dirty as a tramp with half his livid face discolored from a blow he had brought out here in his machine some parisians who had wanted to see the battlefield they were reporters and he was waiting there to take them back at nightfall don marcelo buried his right hand in his pocket two hundred francs if the man would drive him to paris the chauffeur declined with the gravity of a man faithful to his obligations five hundred and he showed his fist bulging with gold coins the man's only response was a twirl of the handle which started the machine to snorting and away they sped there was not a battle in the neighborhood of paris every day in the year his other clients could just wait and settling back into the motor-car desnoyers saw the horrors of the battlefield flying past at a dizzying speed and disappearing behind him he was rolling toward human life he was returning to civilization as they came into paris the nearby empty streets seemed to him to be crowded with people never had he seen the city so beautiful he whirled through the avenue de l'opera whizzed past the place de la concorde and thought he must be dreaming as he realized the gigantic leap that he had taken within the hour he compared all that was now around him with the sights on that plain of death but a few miles away no no it was not possible one of the extremes from this contrast must certainly be false the automobile was beginning to slow down he must be now in the avenue victor hugo he couldn't wake up was that really his home the majestic concierge unable to understand his forlorn appearance greeted him with amazed consternation ah monsieur where has monsieur been in hell muttered don marcelo his wonderment continued when he found himself actually in his own apartment going through its various rooms he was somebody once more the sight of the fruits of his riches and the enjoyment of home comforts restored his self-respect at the same time that the contrast recalled to his mind the recollection of all the humiliations and outrages that he had suffered ah oh, the scoundrels two mornings later the doorbell rang a visitor there came toward him a soldier a little soldier of the infantry timid with his kepis in his hand stuttering excuses in spanish i knew that you were here i come to that voice dragging him from the dark hallway don marcelo conducted him to the balcony how handsome he looked the kepis was red but darkened with wear the cloak too large was torn and darned the great shoes had a strong smell of leather yet never had his son appeared to him so elegant so distinguished looking as now fitted out in these rough ready-made clothes you you the father embraced him convulsively crying like a child and trembling so that he could no longer stand he had always hoped that they would finally understand each other his blood was coursing through the boy's veins he was good with no other defect than a certain obstinacy he was excusing him now for all the past blaming himself for a great part of it he had been too hard you a soldier he kept exclaiming over and over you defending my country when it is not yours and he kissed him again receding a few steps so as to get a better look at him decidedly he was more fascinating now in his grotesque uniform than when he was so celebrated for his skill as a dancer and idolized by the women when the delighted father was finally able to control his emotion his eyes still filled with tears glowed with a malignant light a spasm of hatred furrowed his face go he said simply you do not know what war is i have just come from it i have seen it close by this is not a war like other wars with rational enemies it is a hunt of wild beasts shoot without a scruple against them all 
every one that you overcome rids humanity of a dangerous menace he hesitated a few seconds then added with tragic calm perhaps you may encounter familiar faces family ties are not always formed to our tastes men of your blood are on the other side if you see any one of them do not hesitate shoot he is your enemy kill him kill him end of section fifty four five part three chapter one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain part three chapter one after the marne at the end of october the desnoyers family returned to paris dona luisa could no longer live in biarritz so far from her husband in vain la romantica discoursed on the dangers of a return the government was still in bordeaux the president of the republic and the ministry making only the most hurried apparitions in the capital the course of the war might change at a minute that little affair of the marne was but a momentary relief but the good senora after having read don marcelo's letters opposed an adamantine will to all contrary suggestions besides she was thinking of her son her julio now a soldier she believed that by returning to paris she might in some ways be more in touch with him than at this seaside resort near the spanish frontier chichi also wished to return because rene was now filling the greater part of her thoughts absence had shown her that she was really in love with him such a long time without seeing her little sugar soldier so the family abandoned their hotel life and returned to the avenue victor hugo since the shock of the first september days paris had been gradually changing its aspect the nearly two million inhabitants who had been living quietly in their homes without letting themselves be drawn into the panic had accepted the victory with grave serenity none of them could explain the exact course of the battle they would learn all about it when it was entirely finished one september sunday at the hour when the parisians are accustomed to take advantage of the lovely twilight they had learned from the newspapers of the great triumph of the allies and of the great danger which they had so narrowly escaped the people were delighted but did not however abandon their calm demeanor six weeks of war had radically changed the temperament of turbulent and impressionable paris the victory was slowly restoring the capital to its former aspect a street that was practically deserted a few weeks before was now filled with transients the shops were reopening the neighbors accustomed to the conventional silence of their deserted apartment houses again heard sounds of returning life in the homes above and below them don marcelo's satisfaction in welcoming his family home was considerably clouded by the presence of dona elena she was germany returning to the encounter the enemy again established within his tents would he never be able to free himself from this bondage she was silent in her brother-in-law's presence because recent events had rather bewildered her her countenance was stamped with a wondering expression as though she were gazing at the upsetting of the most elemental physical laws in reflective silence she was puzzling over the marne enigma unable to understand how it was that the germans had not conquered the ground on which she was treading and in order to explain this failure she resorted to the most absurd suppositions one especially engrossing matter was increasing her sadness her sons what would become of her sons don marcelo had never told her of his meeting with captain von hartrott he was maintaining absolute silence about his sojourn in villeblanche he had no desire to recount his adventures at the battle of the marne 
what was the use of saddening his loved ones with such miseries he simply told dona luisa who was alarmed about the possible fate of the castle that they would not be able to go there for many years to come because the hostilities had rendered it uninhabitable a covering of zinc sheeting had been substituted for the ancient roof in order to prevent further injury from wind and rain to the wrecked interior later on after peace had been declared they would think about its renovation just now it had too many inhabitants and all the ladies including dona elena shuddered in imagining the thousands of buried bodies forming their ghastly circle around the building this vision made frau von hartrott again groan ay my sons finally for humanity's sake her brother-in-law set her mind at rest regarding the fate of one of them the captain von hartrott he was in perfect health at the beginning of the battle he knew that this was so from a friend who had conversed with him and he did not wish to talk further about him dona luisa was spending part of each day in the churches trying to quiet her uneasiness with prayer these petitions were no longer vague and generous for the fate of millions of unknown men for the victory of an entire people with maternal self-centeredness they were focused on one single person her son who was a soldier like the others and perhaps at this very moment was exposed to the greatest danger the tears that he had cost her she had implored that he and his father might come to understand each other and finally just as god was miraculously granting her supplication julio had taken himself off to the field of death her entreaties never went alone to the throne of grace some one was praying near her formulating identical requests the tearful eyes of her sister were raised at the same time as hers to the figure of the crucified saviour lord save my son when uttering these words dona luisa always saw julio as he looked in a pale photograph which he had sent his father from the trenches with kepis and military cloak a gun in his right hand and his face shadowed by a growing beard oh lord have mercy upon us and dona elena was at the same time contemplating a group of officers with helmets and reseda uniforms reinforced with leather pouches for the revolver field glasses and maps with sword belt of the same material oftentimes when don marcelo saw them setting forth together towards saint honor de lo he would wax very indignant they are juggling with god this is most unreasonable how could he grant such contrary petitions ah these women and then with that superstition which danger awakens he began to fear that his sister-in-law might cause some grave disaster to his son divinity fatigued with so many contradictory prayers was going to turn his back and not listen to any of them why did not this fatal woman take herself off he felt as exasperated at her presence in his home as he had at the beginning of hostilities dona luisa was still innocently repeating her sister's statements submitting them to the superior criticism of her husband in this way don marcelo had learned that the victory of the marne had never really happened it was an invention of the allies the german generals had deemed it prudent to retire through profound strategic foresight deferring till a little later the conquest of paris and the french had done nothing but follow them over the ground which they had left free that was all she knew the opinions of military men of neutral countries she had been talking in biarritz with some people of unusual intelligence she knew what the german papers were saying about it nobody over there believed that yarn about the marne the people did not even know that there had been such a battle your sister said that interrupted desnoyers pale with wrath and amazement but he could do nothing but keep on longing for the bodily transformation of this enemy planted under his roof ay if she could only be changed into a man if only the evil genius of her husband could but take her place for a brief half hour but the war still goes on said dona luisa in artless perplexity the enemy is still in france what good did the battle of the marne do 
she accepted his explanations with intelligent noddings of the head seeming to take them all in and an hour afterwards would be repeating the same doubts she nevertheless began to evince a mute hostility toward her sister until now she had been tolerating her enthusiasms in favor of her husband's country because she always considered family ties of more importance than the rivalries of nations just because desnoyers happened to be a frenchman and karl a german she was not going to quarrel with elena but suddenly this forbearance had vanished her son was now in danger better that all the von hartrotz should die than that julio should receive the most insignificant wound she began to share the bellicose sentiments of her daughter recognizing in her an exceptional talent for appraising events and now desiring all of chichi's dagger thrusts to be converted into reality End of section 55three chapter one continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain fortunately la romantica took herself off before this antipathy crystallized she was accustomed to pass the afternoon somewhere outside and on her return would repeat the news gleaned from friends unknown to the rest of the family this made don marcelo wax very indignant because of the spies still hidden in paris what mysterious world was his sister-in-law frequenting suddenly she announced that she was leaving the following morning she had obtained a passport to switzerland and from there she would go to germany it was high time for her to be returning to her own she was most appreciative of the hospitality shown her by the family and desnoyers bade her good-bye with aggressive irony his regards to von hartrott he was hoping to pay him a visit in berlin as soon as possible one morning dona luisa instead of entering the neighboring church as usual continued on to the rue de la pompe pleased at the thought of seeing the studio once more it seemed to her that in this way she might put herself more closely in touch with her son this would be a new pleasure even greater than poring over his photograph or re-reading his last letter she was hoping to meet argensola the friend of good counsels for she knew that he was still living in the studio twice he had come to see her by the service stairway as in the old days but she had been out as she went up in the elevator her heart was palpitating with pleasure and distress it occurred to the good lady that the foolish virgins must have had feelings like this when for the first time they fell from the heights of virtue the tears came to her eyes when she beheld the room whose furnishings and pictures so vividly recalled the absent argensola hastened from the door at the end of the room agitated confused and greeting her with expressions of welcome at the same time that he was putting sundry objects out of sight a woman's sweater lying on the divan he covered with a piece of oriental drapery a hat trimmed with flowers he sent flying into a far-away corner dona luisa fancied that she saw a bit of gauzy feminine negligee embroidered in pink flitting past the window frame upon the divan were two big coffee cups and bits of toast evidently left from a double breakfast these artists the same as her son and she was moved to compassion over the bad life of julio's counsellor my honour dona luisa my dear madame desnoyers he was speaking in french and at the top of his voice looking frantically at the door through which the white and rosy garments had flitted he was trembling at the thought that his hidden companion not understanding the situation might in a jealous fit compromise him by a sudden apparition then he spoke to his unexpected guest about the soldier exchanging news with her dona luisa repeated almost word for word the paragraphs of his letters so frequently read argensola modestly refrained from displaying his 
the two friends were accustomed to an epistolary style which would have made the good lady blush a valiant man affirmed the spaniard proudly looking upon the deeds of his comrade as though they were his own a true hero and i madame desnoyers know something about what that means his chiefs know how to appreciate him julio was a sergeant after having been only two months in the campaign the captain of his company and the other officers of the regiment belonged to the fencing club in which he had had so many triumphs what a career he enthused he is one of those who in youth reach the highest ranks like the generals of the revolution and what wonders he has accomplished the budding officer had merely referred in the most casual way to some of the exploits with the indifference of one accustomed to danger and expecting the same attitude from his comrades but his chum exaggerated them enlarging upon them as though they were the culminating events of the war he had carried an order across an infernal fire after three messengers trying to accomplish the same feat had fallen dead he had been the first to attack many trenches and had saved many of his comrades by means of the blows from his bayonet and hand-to-hand -hand encounters whenever his superior officers needed a reliable man they invariably said let sergeant desnoyers be called he rattled off all this as though he had witnessed it as if he had just come from the seat of war making dona luisa tremble and pour forth tears of joy mingled with fear over the glories and dangers of her son that argensola certainly possessed the gift of affecting his hearers by the realism with which he told his stories in gratitude for these eulogies she felt that she ought to show some interest in his affairs what had he been doing of late i madame have been where i ought to be i have not budged from this spot i have witnessed the siege of paris in vain his reason protested against the inexactitude of that word siege under the influence of his readings about the war of eighteen seventy he had classed as a siege all those events which had developed near paris during the course of the battle of the marne he pointed modestly to a diploma in a gold frame hanging above the piano against a tricolored flag it was one of the papers sold in the streets a certificate of residence in the capital during the week of danger he had filled in the blanks with his name and description of his person and at the foot were very conspicuous the signatures of two residents of the rue de la pompe a tavern keeper and a friend of the concierge the district commissary of police with stamp and seal had guaranteed the respectability of these honorable witnesses nobody could remain in doubt after such precautions as to whether he had or had not witnessed the siege of paris he had such incredulous friends in order to bring the scene more dramatically before his amiable listener he recalled the most striking of his impressions for her special benefit once in broad daylight he had seen a flock of sheep in the boulevard near the madeleine their tread had resounded through the deserted streets like echoes from the city of the dead he was the only pedestrian on the sidewalks thronged with cats and dogs his military recollections excited him like tales of glory i have seen the march of the soldiers from morocco i have seen the zouaves in automobiles end of section fifty six